I'm Bree Luck, and you are listening to the Pause to Go podcast, where we explore the process of turning life's transitions into stellar transformations. You can expect interviews with experts, straight talk with remarkable humans, and conversations about making the most of every phase of life. Because when we approach life's stickiest spots with curiosity, support, and a little bit of inspiration, anything is possible. So whether you're on your way to work or settling in with your favorite beverage, together we can pause to go. As a solopreneur, I really like the flexibility to work from pretty much anywhere, so I'm happy to head down to Codebase Coworking, where I can enjoy the company of others while I tackle my to-do list. Also, they have a state-of-the-art, consumer-friendly podcasting studio that is, frankly, my home away from home. So head over to Codebase Coworking, check it out, and when you do, tell them that Bree sent you. On this season of Pause to Go, I'm going to be talking with creative change makers who are truly inspirational. And I am delighted to open this season with this interview with Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. Jocelyn is the author of My Monticello, a fiction debut that was called A Masterly Feat by the New York Times and was a finalist for the Kirkus Prize. She's been a fellow at Tin House, Hedgebrook, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. Her writing appears in Guernica, The Guardian, and elsewhere. Her short story, Control Negro, so good, was anthologized in the Best American Short Stories of 2018 and was even read aloud by LeVar Burton for selected shorts. Jocelyn was a longtime public school art teacher, and she lives and writes, where I live and write, in Charlottesville, Virginia. One of the things that I'm particularly interested in for this episode is the deft way that Jocelyn used a painful and terrible moment in our community's recent history, well, several moments really, but I'm speaking specifically about the Unite the Right rally on August 11th and 12th of 2017, and then also the horrible environmental events that have taken place around the country, like California fires and other very real effects of climate change. And through creative engagement and diligence, she crafted a book of short stories in the novella that not only transformed those events into something strangely more accessible to us, but also allowed her to process the events and move through them herself. I know that this book helped me to feel more connected to others, to even the people I felt most isolated from, most different from. And so this interview is divided into two sections. You're hearing part one today, which is really focusing on the cultural inspiration and the impact of my Monticello. And then next week, check back in. Actually, just click subscribe or follow right now so you don't miss it. Because next week, Jocelyn will share more about her personal creative process, how she finds inspiration, where it gets challenging, and the realities of sending your work beyond your safety zone. So enjoy part one of this interview with Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi. Hi, (laughs) Bree. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. (laughs) Um, A big fan of my Monticello and just a big fan of you. So it's been such a joy to see your work recognized after so many years. And you you really exemplify exactly what I want this next phase of pause to go to be, which is creative change makers, right? People who, well, who are navigating really challenging periods of life in a creative way and finding a way to truly transform a moment. Whether or not you feel <laughs> that is happening, it's, that's certainly what I see. I don't know. Does it feel that way to you? Do you feel like it's a transformative moment for you? I do. I do in a kind of in a a bunch of ways, particularly like artistically. So the book that I wrote, my Monticello that came out this fall really came out of me wrestling with a incredibly difficult transition time in the country and locally here in Charlottesville, Virginia. And so that was very much 
you know, born of that change and that transition and that difficulty. And then also just writing, writing, writing for a really long time, but being a public school art teacher full time. And then, you know, the pandemic and selling my book and all the change that's come from, from that, those two things. As someone who lives in Charlottesville, I have found my Monticello to be an incredibly healing and energizing book. When I read it, first of all, you and I have known each other for a long time. We, we're in overlapping social circles. We ha- I've been friends with your husband for many years too. And there's something about reading reading something that not only tackles really, really challenging events in Charlottesville, and I'm thinking particularly of a Black UVA student who was beaten and actually was not an isolated event, right? It was just one that got more attention. And then, of course, the events of August 11th and 12th that were also not isolated, but certainly a culmination of what seemed to be happening around the country and a harbinger of what was to come. The way that you have interpreted and then transformed those events into stories, because I don't want to discount what came from you, right? It's really easy as someone who lives in Charlottesville to say, oh, this is this and that is that. And and it's not. It's you. It's your interpretation of that. So I, I guess where I'm going with this is like, on one hand, there's this healing of like, oh my gosh, you see, this is how it feels. <laughs> this is what it felt like for a community. But then also having it filtered through you and feeling the human Jocelyn behind that and knowing that this is what was living in your brain is really, really moving. I I wonder, what has that been like for you living in Charlottesville? What has the response been in the community for you? Yeah, it's been really interesting. So like a lot of people who make art, you know, I'm kind of an introvert. And so I have like the public face of having been a public school teacher here for many, many years and knowing a lot of people through that. But people don't necessarily know what in your brain and fiction, when I write fiction in particular, these stories, it's a whole different aspect of how I'm seeing things. So I always say, I, you know, it's kind of where my darker thoughts go and things I worry about the most go and things I notice that are kind of unspeakable go is into fiction. So it's like a whole nother kind of part of my imagination and brain. And so it's interesting for people in your community to have <laughs> set with that particularly around events, you know, the the Unite the Right rally here where we had these marauding white nationalists and white supremacists kind of converge from all over the state and all over the country to ostensibly to to protest the idea of removing Confederate statues, but in reality coming with swastikas and machine guns and torches and and with a lot of rhetoric shouted that just was much broader than that and this idea of who belongs here and so forth. So it's really interesting to have people in your mind thinking about the things you're sensitive to and the things you think about, but also about how you are interpreting and feeling about this event that they also in some way experienced or saw. So I see, it's it's just funny because I live near First Street, which is featured in the book. And I walk my dogs and I have really bad dogs. I have two very, very bad dogs. And uh, I'm walking my dogs like down the street, looking like a hobo, <laughs> like just like normal and my like <laughs> not fancy. And like a car will like slow down and I'm like, they're going to slow down and say something about the book. And they're like, I'm listening to your audio book or I've read your book or my book club's reading your book. And, and all of it has been really, really kind and warm actually and really enthusiastic, but also you know, it's hard stuff. So I had my my parents' neighbor, who's an older white man, said, I've read the end of the novella 10 times. I just wanted you to know. And so that's like, or people will tell me where they were when these events happened or something that they felt about it. So it's a little, it can be a little bit intense. Yeah. That you keep having to stay in that place, even after writing this, which I would imagine is a little bit of a releasing of that. Oh, it is. I think there was a cathartic aspect to writing it, to writing what 
the things you fear most and going, you know, I kind of took these real events and rode into a future that is not the future that I hope for, for any of us. There's a paradox in it because you have power in what you decide to write about and that can feel really empowering. And the stories, this idea of reclamation, it has this kind of the fantasy of reclamation. What 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 is it like when you center a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings in Monticello too? Like, what would that feel like to have that person feel at home there? It's cathartic, but also I wanted readers to kind of take what I'm worried about and have it on their minds too. But then they bring it back to me too. Do you know what I mean? I'm like, this yeah, is what I'm worried about. Let's all worry about it. You worry about it for a little while. I'm going to rest. And they're like, but wait a minute, what should we do about it? What do you think? What were you saying? What, what happened? And you know, so. And that's, you know, that's really, I was, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was like, what, what would you like to happen? You've given us this incredible book to grapple with these issues on a very human level, meaning a very emotional level, right? That it's not about statistics. It's not, it, it's, it's about characters who are very richly drawn, who then inhabit our hearts and our minds, even in the short story format, which also I have to say is just perfect. It's one of the things I'm most proud of is that this book came into the world as short stories in a novella. And for anyone who knows anything about publishing, short stories are just not like the sexiest thing. And the way that we see them in our country and the way some readers look at them, you know, the novel's kind of the standard and then short stories are like way down there. And then like poetry is like the, like the, you know, the most exquisite and highest art form, but it's kind of the lowest in the like, in the publishing totem pole of, of access, right. Of what people might pick up just to read for the average reader. And so unless someone's into poetry or into short stories or someone who studies literature. So I'm really, really proud that this book came in this weird format that kind of reflected what I was interested in at the time and yet has found a broader group of readers and been kind of put out in spaces where novels might have, might have dominated or might dominate generally. Well, it, it's, it really feels perfect for it because it's a collection of stories, right? And, and so each one gives a different perspective on these issues. And, and so it's not overwhelming. It's like, it, it's like we keep going in from different ways. <laughs> You're enveloped without being smothered. I guess that's the way that I feel. I felt enveloped. It felt like being held in a space. I like, I like that point of view. And I, I like that idea of, you know, the stories all center black characters, you know, there's men, women, children, they're pretty big variety of voice and different kinds of characters. But I like this idea that even within any identity, there's no monolith. And so when you do short stories, there's a way in which that's just at the forefront, because you have Mm -hmm. different characters experiencing, in this case, different and similar things. They're experiencing this idea of home, this idea of longing, this idea of being on the outside of something or defining what home is for them or seeing how they're seen by where they perceive as home. And so, but they all have different individual experiences that they're bringing to that. And so I think that just resists this idea of one way of seeing or one way of being. I've been thinking about so often the white community projects any black perspective as speaking for all of the black community, right? I do also feel like because you are presenting so many different characters who have different histories, different perspectives, different foibles, different, they're just different stories. I felt like maybe that wouldn't happen as much, but was that a thought for you? Has that been an issue for you? I think that it's, the short story format really helps. I think it does help quite a bit, but I still think, I don't know if this is true for, this is probably true for all writers. I think it can be more true for writers of color and for women is that people really want it to be you. So they're like, you're in Indonesia <laughs> or, you know, and I don't know if there's something that's a compliment in that because they just identify with it so much that they feel like it has to be you. But then you're also like, I actually have a really big imagination. And <laughs> Obviously, they can't say I'm Denasia Love and the narrator of the first story, Cornelius Adams, because they're so dramatically different. And I love something about that. When when you have this 
whole constellation of characters who are just distinct unto themselves. So there's something really nice about that. And even in the novella, which takes up the majority of the book, and which a lot of people have talked to me about, there's a cast of characters in in the novella too. So in a way, it also resists this idea of there's one way to react. And that was because I was thinking about our community. And to be fair, I was thinking about it from the perspective of a public school teacher. So this idea of what happens when we're smushed together, not just with people who we identify with in whatever way, because they're friends, because they're family, because they're from a culture that's ours, because they look like us, but also people who are different than us, right? So there's young and old people, there's immigrants in the group, there's neighbors from around the corner, there's, you know, the 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 neighbors who gentrified the street over, and, you know, they're all kind of pressed together in the space in the way that you might be in a public school. It felt very real, felt very true, I guess, is the is the word that I would use for it. And did you, you also, so Tanisha and, and Mavai are descendants of Thomas Jefferson as well. And we live in Charlottesville where there, there are many descendants of Thomas Jefferson living here. And I'm thinking of that particularly because, because many of those descendants have been in the spotlight in the last five years, three years, five years. And so I wonder, was there concern about how that was being presented? Because it takes a lot of courage. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage to do that. So what was that like for you? Yeah. So first, I'll just say for anyone who hasn't read the story. So my Monticello is the story of this group of neighbors. It's kind of a near future, slightly, I would say, apocalyptic light. <laughs> you know, the future that could be now where there's these storms have rolled through and there's been some sort of breakdown and they don't kind of kind of know the parameters of the breakdown, but cell phones aren't working, the power isn't on, and this group of marauding white supremacists kind of come into this space, and they go to this one particular street where there's public housing, and they basically roust everyone out and start setting the place on fire. And this group of neighbors escape in a jaunt bus, and 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 it, which is like a little local people who live here will know these little public buses and they go up end up going up to Monticello and taking refuge in this historic plantation home of Thomas Jefferson led by Denasia Love Denasia Hemings Love and her grandmother Ma Violet or Ma V who are descendants of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings an enslaved woman that he had children with so when I wrote this I'm not a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings I actually got the idea to write to connect kind of the infrastructure and environmental and social breakdown that I saw, that I see now and all that I saw very specifically in August 11th and 12th in Charlottesville in 2017, when we had the Unite the Right rally here, we unwittingly hosted this violent rally here to Thomas Jefferson, because I went to an event in 2018 where descendants stood up in an audience and said, and was introduced as a, this woman stood up and was introduced as a descendant of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And when I saw her, I thought, this all connects. And how does this connect? What's the relationship to the founding fathers here with some of the racial and, well, I will say racial tensions that we have now, you know? And so that was that, so an actual living descendant here was kind of the connective point for me. So then when I started to write the story and was excited about the story, it totally occurred to me that people both here and elsewhere who are real descendants, you know, I was, you know, take, making a voice within that, this imagined voice of a descendant. And I wanted to be thoughtful of that and respectful of that. And so I actually talked to Monticello and they have a getting the word out project. And I had them kind of put these bulletins. I asked them to put these bulletins in their newsletter to let people know about the book. Once I knew the book was going to be published and to, um, offer for people to contact me if they had thoughts, concerns before the book was finalized, before I'd done all the editing. And I actually didn't hear from anybody, but I felt really good that I at least put it out there in the world. And I tried to read through it with an eye for what would I be sensitive to, not only as a Black descendant of slavery at Monticello, but just as a community member, as you know, I have all these different groups in there. And it's it's an impossible task because if you're going to write literature, you have to in one way, silence the idea of what the reader is going to think. But I wanted to be at least responsible and thoughtful about it. So I did actually think about like, what will this feel like if my neighbor reads it? What will this feel like if 
you know, I thought about that um, after I made it and I did edit with an eye to some of the edges of it, but I didn't really change the core of the story because the core of the story felt true to what my experience was. And then I will just say as the end of this little anecdote, I did end up reading at Monticello and I met a handful of descendants of slavery, not just of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, but of other families that lived whose ancestors lived as enslaved people there, came to the reading and I ended up having lunch with the person who had inspired the whole event. I met her. And so it was really nice to have at least these individuals be excited about the project and 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 hopefully recognize my intention to be respectful of their real history. Have you gotten much pushback? I have not. And I really, you know, I'm I'm slightly waiting for the other shoe to drop, but I have to say in writing this, just to talk about race, just to have characters who are dealing with microaggressions and then what I say is microaggressions, being physically assaulted, having all kinds of issues that relate to race at every level from a mental, psychological uh, standpoint to a physical standpoint to an emotional standpoint. I really worried that I would hear from people in a nasty way, especially on social Mm -hmm. media, especially being a female writer. I hope I'm not inviting that now, but that has not been my experience so far. And I'm really, really extremely thankful for it. I know that I know other writers that really have written about things in the similar vein that have really had bad experiences, but so far I haven't. And even if I end up having a bad experience, just this period of not having one, you know, just having, being able to bring my book into the world for these months without having that and having the opposite happen has been such a pleasure that I feel like it will kind of put those other things in a different context, as opposed to if that had been my first experience or really early on. Yeah. Well, first of all, I hope that you don't, right? <laughs> and and the book is so loving. It's also, I just want to point out, it's not all, it, it is heavy. There's a lot. I mean, it's, it's grappling with some of the most painful issues that our country is facing, that humanity is facing. It's like, it's, it, it's just huge. But there's also so much love. There's love throughout the book. It has so much heart. And there's also levity. I mean, having this this collection of folks going and taking over Monticello, like it's kind of a childhood dream. <laughs> oh, it's totally the night at the museum. They're like, get to touch everything. It's like, there is a fun element to it. I mean, aside from this bigger idea of reclamation, it's just like a joy. And it was a joy to, for me to go to Monticello and take like the fancy tour. I took the the tour where you get to go upstairs and everything and be writing down like the twins are going to be in this room. And oh my gosh, you know, Miss Edith will totally be here because she's like this. It it was made it so much more fun for me to be there and more exciting. I mean, even just the gift shop, (laughs) even just the gift shop, when they take the pot of ink and the quill and it's like, oh, that would be so much fun to to go do that. It made me want to go get a pot of ink right then just to play, just the the visceral response that I had to them having access to these things. And yes, this night at the museum approach, I I just really loved it. So I just want to point that out, that it really is beautiful to read and it's incredibly entertaining (laughs) as well. We can focus on the the real and important issues that it brings up, but it's not a polemic, right? It's it's not a polemic. So my husband is an environmental filmmaker. My background is in drama therapy. We really believe in using creative approaches to affect change. And there's so much evidence that shows that if you can engage with people on an emotional level, that they are far more likely to see the world a little bit differently, much more than if we're running stats by them or news articles, things in which we can uh, really remove ourselves from the situation. And and reading, and I'm totally biased because I'm a reader. I love to read. (laughs) But for me, reading, you know, when you write a book and you have a reader, Jocelyn, it's like you become a part of me. And it's like, that happens. There's something, I feel like there's a shift that happens on a cellular level. And I, 
I think about how you said earlier that then you have these people who are coming back and saying, what can we do? You know, like, what do we do now? Like looking to you as a prophet too, which I guess is the danger, the danger of writing something that is so powerful and moving. The danger of being so awesome is that people <laughs> want to turn you into a prophet. And I don't think we quite, quite got to this. Like, how can we be grown ups? Like, what do you say? I, I'm not asking, I'm not asking for a directive from you. I'm asking for what you want. Like, what do you, what do you want people to do after yeah, reading this book? It's so hard to say. I mean, you make something and people are going to bring so much to it. You know, it's kind of a meeting halfway. They're going to bring their feelings to it. I actually had an event last night at CBI, Congregation Beth Israel, which was looking at the book. They did a book club on it. And then we had this kind of culminating event, which we also put out on Zoom for a wider community. And it was looking at the book through the social action lens and social justice lens. At one point, my friend who was the moderator was like, what do we, what do you do? <laughs> like, he literally was like, how do you stop racism and everything else? And I was like, I don't know. You can't ask me that. But he'd given me the question before I knew he was going to come towards that question. Maybe not quite so boldly. So I had thought about <laughs> it. And, you know, I think the two answers I gave are true. One is that the reason I wrote the book was because I didn't know how to respond to August 12th and to these broader changes and steps backwards, in my opinion, that our country's making. So it's a reflection of things in the past that I think we've worked to get away from and then moving back towards them. I didn't know exactly what to do. And so I wrote the book. That's what I did. I, that's how I like wrestled with it personally. But then there's this other way in which I think I do know some of the things that are important important for us to do because, well, I know what's important for me to do. I'll put it that way. And things that I hope other people do, which is I kind of left my characters in the novella in a predicament. And that's the very last story in the book. And there's an open-ended ending. And the reason I did that was because I think it would be really silly for 20 some people on Monticello to solve racism <laughs> and for us to all close the book and say, well, that was a good read. That was really fun. I really wanted the reader to be left with this question of, I don't want them to be there. So I want to do something to intervene on their behalf, or this isn't the future that I want. So I feel compelled to do something. I'm worried about them and I want it to be different. And, and therefore I'm willing to consider how I can be different to make it better. And I know for myself, it's really easy to see when you feel targeted and it's really hard sometimes to empathize with all the people around you and some of the things they might be going through. It's really easy for you to want the things around you to work, but sometimes it's harder to advocate for, I mean, I think as our country, as we think about infrastructure, social infrastructure, minimum wage, who gets paid for what, who's valued. I mean, it's really easy to see it when it's affecting you or your children, but sometimes we don't feel compelled to have equity and to advocate for other people who are suffering or to even believe them or to even acknowledge when we know for a fact that something was horrible, but to acknowledge it as if that will take something away from our character, not, not it having happened, but to acknowledge it. Just being kind of a humble seeker of understanding, right? And recognizing what we don't know, being willing to believe the way books can put us in other people's shoes, but listening and paying attention to the people in our community and around us and in, in the world that are telling us something is hurtful <laughs> and like actually, you know, taking that to heart and being open about it and, and considering it. All the problems we have are so huge. It can be very overwhelming. So I think there's this way in which we have to build community and build alliance. And that's in politics, but that's also just in the spaces closer around us. I think the book says we're all connected. Certainly the novella has this idea that everyone is connected, whether we recognize it or not. And we build alliances that reflect that, right? So that we actually acknowledge it. We're connected even to the people who are saying things that are the exact opposite of what I want for America and so forth. So how do we create communities that are connected and that see and that acknowledge that we sink or rise together? You know, we're only as strong as the, the, the person who's suffering the most. And so mm -hmm. I think that that would change our whole way of being. And it's not easy. Obviously, people much smarter and braver than me have been talking about these things and wrestling with these things and being extremely compelling on all kinds of fronts on these things. And, and yet, it's kind of the human condition. It's just like a hill you're always climbing and you're kind of working at it. But if things can get worse, 
then things can get better. We've seen things in our country change dramatically in the last five years. Even, you know, you can say things change. We've seen specific changes in the way certain things work. And so if they can change in one way, they can change in a different way as well. And so that's, you know, there's this measure of hope in that for me, even though it feels like a really hard task to, to, to keep things good and make things good and hold the line, even, even just to hold the line sometimes. Thank you for holding the line. Here are my key takeaways from this conversation with Jocelyn Nicole Johnson. Number one, I think it's really easy to have very romantic thoughts about having success as a writer and having a book get a lot of attention, but it can come at a cost. And I can hear how thoughtful Jocelyn was and is to prepare herself for the responses of her readers and her community. Number two, when you're creating a story inspired by real events, there's a fine line between respecting the perspective of others and honoring your own creative vision. I like that Jocelyn wrote her draft first and then carefully garnered feedback without losing the integrity of her piece. Number three, there are many ways to advocate for change, but so much of it boils down to being, as Jocelyn says, a humble seeker of understanding, recognizing what we don't know and remembering that we as a society are only as strong as the people who are suffering the most. Thanks to Jocelyn for writing such an incredible book and her willingness to talk about it. The link to My Monticello is in the show notes, and I really encourage you to read it like today. Thanks also to the very first Pause to Go podcast sponsor, Codebase Coworking, and to WTJU and the Virginia Audio Collective for your support. Also, special shout out to Delinistic for the Pause to Go artwork. And to my show intern, Camden Luck, who has been a lifesaver this month. Thank you so much for listening to the Pause to Go podcast. If you got something out of this episode, let us know. Share it with a friend, join our Facebook group, and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts if you loved it. If not, no worries. We want you to tell it like it is, and we'd love to have your input. If you want to know more about what I'm up to, you can follow me on Instagram at thelovelyunbecoming or at my website, thelovelyunbecoming.com. Stay curious, y'all.